<laughs> you ready to do this? I am, yeah. All right, all right, all right Carrie, let's do this. All right. So we're all set to go here. All right. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. I am very excited to have as my guest today, Carrie Heckman. Carrie, welcome. Thank you so much. Great to be here. All right. So Carrie is a freelance writer and clinical social worker in private practice in Seattle. After 10 years as a high school social worker in the Chicago area, she followed her, intu her intuition to the Pacific Northwest in 2018. There, she was introduced to a therapeutic modality called somatic transformation created by Dr. Sharon Stanley, one of my favorites. She's been on the podcast. This life-changing lens through which to understand trauma and the nervous system taught her how to manage her own complex health issues, as well as help clients who've experienced trauma. Carrie is now inspired to bring this information to as many people as possible to work towards a more embodied world. All right. Awesome. Welcome once again. So before we get going here, Carrie, um, so you're, give our listeners a little background. So you're in Seattle now, you're in Chicago. Where were you, where were you born? Where are you from originally? I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Okay. okay. Lived there until I was 18 when I moved to Illinois for college um, actually went to study musical theater and then in a twist of events um, changed my major to human services which is kind of the precursor for going to grad school for social work okay okay you might know that I'm, I'm currently in Bend we just moved to Bend Oregon like four months ago we're close yeah yeah so all right, let's dive in here. So how did things unfold for you such that you got into this field? Right. So um, I think the, the initial um, inciting incident, um, well, I mean, if I can rewind all the way back to how I got into the field of, of social work, um, you know, when I decided to change my major away from um, theater and move into social work, um, I really, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, it was kind of that moment where I was a little lost and, and needed some guidance and ended up having this synchronistic conversation with somebody going into counseling and then realizing that I had, you know, really my entire young life been so fascinated by people and kind of what makes them who they are. And so it was, it was, seemed like a good fit. And then I um, started studying and really found that it was exactly the right fit, that mm -hmm. everything I was learning was resonating. And I, you know, kind of couldn't wait to learn more. And so eventually, you know, went to graduate school for social work and um, education is really important in my family. So my mom's a, my mom was an elementary school teacher. So thought maybe school social work would be the right fit for me. Um, and it was, you know, it was for a long time until um, it started to get really intense and kind of coincidingly, I started to get sick. And so, you know, I eventually decided that I just wasn't able to maintain that level of intensity at work with my illness, which at that point was still um, mostly undiagnosed, mm -hmm. um, eventually came to be diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease and, uh, left that job and worked part-time at a university and, and really kind of thought, okay, what's the next step where, what can I do that I can also, um, work and maintain my health and that summer, my husband and I went to went on a cruise to Alaska, and I had never felt better in my life. But, you know, the fresh air and the evergreen trees and the mountains, mm -hmm. and it was then I was like, okay, I need to. We we need to be in this. And Alaska wasn't quite realistic, uh, so Seattle felt like a better fit. And um when I came here, decided that it was time to start my private practice, but I really, you know, I was very much new and needed some guidance. So wanted to join a group practice. And one of the group practices I was looking into requested a somatic therapist. And I had never 
heard of this. I didn't know what this was and started researching and just everything that I was learning made complete sense for my life experience, as well as what I was noticing um, in people that I'd worked with and just by chance decided to go to a retreat put on by Dr. Sharon Stanley. And yeah, everything has been somatic therapy since, since that point. Wow. So again, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Dr. Sharon Stanley, she is a somatic therapist, uh, really specializing in trauma. But man, you got to go back and listen to the interviews I've done with her. I've had her on uh, as a guest to Trauma Therapist 2.0, my membership community. And really, uh, Carrie, when I, you know, when we were kind of emailing back and forth and you mentioned her, I was like, all right, she's got to come on the podcast. Shh. <laughs> I mean, I can't say enough about her, but um, first of all, you know, you, you said that position was getting kind of intense and coincidentally or not, you were getting sick. Talk a little bit more about that. Was that intensity? What was that intensity, I guess? Right. I think, um, and in, in the Pacific Northwest, it's not as common to have high school social or social workers working within the schools. Um, but in other parts of the country, um, schools will have a, a social worker on staff. And usually it's, you know, the the ratio between the number of students mm -hmm. and the, the number of social workers is, you know, very unrealistic and not recommended. And so I was the one person in a school of 900. Um, <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, kind of being the 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 main person people go to when things are hard or there's a, a child who needs someone to to hold space for them and 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 help them through difficulty. So, yeah, it was it was um, a little overwhelming to have that number of kind of people in my care. Right. Right. So you know you you talked about. Uh, finding these this these workshop or events and things just clicked for you. Now, there's a couple of things that I think that are really important in in that uh, that I kind of want to unpack if we could. One is the fact that you said things clicked for you. And when there's you know people and the listeners know there's so many modalities out there. What do I work on? What do I choose? What should I pursue? Talk a little bit about how and why that that clicked for you. Right. So. This I, I, I had been learning about the chronic stress response and um, and how that works for people who have illness because um, you know Lyme disease often people it triggers autoimmune disease so often people with Lyme disease have many different autoimmune diseases and that's basically a an, a twenty four seven chronic stress response in the body. Um, so I, I knew about that, but I didn't know how that um, related to trauma and how, you know, similar to illness, trauma can dysregulate the nervous system and cause people to be in a chronic stress response. And everything made sense from, from there on out. And somatic transformation specifically, what, which is what um, Sharon created, is this relational approach to that. So it's really about the relationship between the therapist and the client and how healing that is. And that had been my, um, you know, modal modality or therapeutic lean ever since I started working in social work was that it was about the relationship. And so that really made so much sense to me. And then this idea of co-regulation, right? Like we regulate with another before we can regulate on our own. And it's it's just all of those things together really clicked, like I said, and, and started to, to feel like, okay, this is what I need to be doing. And I guess the body, the body element of it as well in the body-based therapy, because it's, you know, when you're a young therapist, the idea of re-traumatization is so scary. You don't want to do anything that 
um, will harm somebody that you care about and you want to help. And so the idea that you can work with the body and not have to retell a story that uh, is traumatic and, and would bring up a, a traumatic stress response um, was comforting for me as the therapist, but also knowing that that can be effective, that it's, it's not, you're not avoiding anything, you're leaning into the nervous system's ability to process and heal through the body. You mentioned um, early on, you you kind of understood the importance of the relationship. Um, I I didn't. I mean, I kind of knew that was there, and I knew it was a thing, but I I didn't really get it, quite honestly, until you know I started doing this podcast and uh, I, I learned more. Talk about that for you, like. How, how did you get, because a lot of people don't, I mean, a lot of, I think a lot of people do understand it, but they don't get how vital it is. If, if, if not the most important thing, what, talk about that from, from your perspective in your world. How did that make sense to you? You know, the reason it, it, it makes sense to me is that trauma happens in relationship. And so if we are hoping to heal, that also needs to happen in relationship. And um, a person needs to know that someone cares and someone sees them and that that, that in itself is the most healing element mm -hmm. is that we are relational. Everything we do is in relationship. And if all you have is um, traumatic memories of of relationships, you need to know that relationships can be good and connected and real and authentic. And, um, and, and I think that as long as you genuinely care about the person that you're working with, that they will feel that somatically, whether or not they cognitively even realize it, they will mm -hmm. feel it somatically. And that is where that starts to, people start to lay down some of those defenses um, when how, how did this whole, the trauma element come in for you? Talk about that. Yeah. So I think as, uh, uh at least kind of in my life experience, and I, I don't know why that was the reason, but the idea to, of trauma was always, you know, war, car accidents, um, things that we all fear and dread and if, if one of those things wasn't present, that, that, that trauma wasn't present. And um, then when I um, decided to go into private practice, I thought, okay, you know, as much trauma as I've worked with, I, this is a gap for me. I need some strategies to work with people who have trauma. And that's why I signed up to go see Sharon and learn about it. And then it was, oh, mm -hmm. everyone has trauma. We all have trauma that lives in our body. And um, then, you know, it was like, okay. And, and the other thing that really clicked for me was this, um, you know, this concept of people who have a lot of self-hatred or a lot of self-loathing and they, work to get help and it really it's kind of that feeling that just doesn't go away and when I learned that that feeling was connected to trauma it was like okay that's that's my work like that is where where I want to be because of how difficult that feeling is of this kind of being an outsider not belonging not being good enough not having worth um and how that there is a part of that in all of us too. Um, but for the people where that's a really big part, um, that's who I wanted to work with. And when I learned about how that was connected to trauma, it was just, okay, here's here's where I need to be. This is the work that I need to be doing. Wow. I mean, to hear you say that to, is exciting to me because I think when whenever we find are able and fortunate enough to have that feeling and that sensation, I think it's I think it's an awesome feeling because like it, it lights us up. It's like, okay, that, that makes sense to me. So what does that look like to you 
in, in session. And I realize this is a crazy question and it's different for everybody, but, but can you break it down? What does that, what does that mean? Like when you're, when you're in relationship with someone and, and trying to, to create that environment, what does it look like? Yeah. So, um, I kind of have these, these signposts that I, that I hold in my mind. Um, and they kind of guide me to remember that, um, really this is about helping someone feel seen and, but seen in, on the body, the level of the body and the level of the trauma that is sometimes not even understood. Um, so there's the signpost, right, of curiosity, like this person is their own expert on themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I really try to turn off that analytical, um, academic side and, and really work on the curiosity of, okay, if this person is the expert in who they are, and I really want to know them, then I need to maintain my curiosity throughout this session. Um, and, you know, our life, our left brain, really good at pulling us into that analytical academic place. So just constantly reminding myself to be curious about the person and that I really do want to know um, what that feeling is like for them and, and what their life experience has been like for them. And then, um, so that, you know, there's the curiosity and then there's there, there really is that um, genuine, authentic attunement, you know, which is a word Sharon uses a lot is um, we are really attuning to the person. So what are those little clues that I'm receiving that maybe this person doesn't feel seen, right? Are they, um, you know, did something shift in their body where they, you know, dropped down or is, uh, um, did, did they sigh or, you know, what are, what are the clues that, that I can get that, um, this person isn't feeling seen in that moment and how can I do better to resonate and, um, attune to, to how this person is feeling? How can I ask the right questions, um, about their experience to elicit that understanding so that they can feel that? I mean, it's out listening to you talk. First of all, this is this is amazing. This is what I love doing. Why I love doing this podcast. It sounds it sounds challenging. It sounds real. I mean, you talked about not you know kind of letting the academic go. Of course, that doesn't mean letting everything you know go or the knowledge go. But to get to that space that you're talking about, where you're able to have that awareness about what's going on with the person in front of you and your own self, was that process of, of getting there, was, was that a challenge for you? Talk about a little bit about how you got to that space where you were able to do that. Right. Um, I, I, I think a lot of it is um, having your own somatic therapist. That's a huge part of it. Um, because I needed to co-regulate with another person to learn the resources of my body in order to maintain grounding and maintaining embodiment um, because so much is, is intuition, right? It's so mm -hmm. much about what is just coming up. What is just that image that flashes into my mind? What is that word that's coming up? What is that question that's coming up? And I in order to do that, we need to be embodied. So we need to go through the process of unpacking our life experiences, which you know I can tell you I have many um, that I need that I needed and need to continue to to work through uh, in that way. And um, and and so it's it's not a a, a, a perfect Zen like embodiment, right? It's this constant checking in and you know, am I, am I starting to get away from, from myself? Okay. I need to come, come back into the body. And I think it's the most challenging thing that anyone can do ever. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. It's what we're calling on our clients to do. It's what we're calling on ourselves to do. And it is the most challenging thing we will ever do. It sounds like there's 
you know, you, one has to have, you know, you talked about intuition, like self-trust, trusting um, your own sensations and feelings and emotions and, uh, and at the same time, being able to modulate what's coming out of your mouth in a sense. Um, yeah, it, it's, it sounds very challenging, but so, I mean, I, I love hearing you talk about this process of really seeing someone on a somatic level too, and what that means. Yeah, it's, um, it, you know, it, it, the reason why, and, and maybe this is something where I still have a lot of learning to do about um, how, what, what is that? What is happening when um, we are seeing someone on a somatic level that allows us to maybe release trauma or allows us to let down a defense that we've been holding on to for our entire lifetime sometimes. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know exactly what that um, is, but it's, you know, it's pretty magical and it's pretty amazing that we're able to do it. Yeah. Let's talk about um, kind of an early clinical error. Uh, your your one clinical error. <laughs> oh yeah, there was just one. And what you, what what you learned from that? What would you share? Yeah, so um, I, I did kind of try to mine the 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 experiences I've had to come up with kind of that one um, thing. But if I could broaden it a little bit. Um, I do think it, it falls into um, really, I think every early clinician needs a therapist and needs a consult, uh, like a, a consulting therapist. And it's, that's the self-care that I wasn't giving myself that I, I need to give myself now. Um, but I do think it's this idea that I think young clinicians really want to want to fix and want to solve unsolvable problems. And I was caught in that that trap a lot, especially when I was working in, in the high school because these, these problems were not fixable. And really it was just about how can I be here and attune to this person? Um, and I think a lot of times you know, when, when you're working in a secondary setting and you have all these different stakeholders, um, I think that part got missed sometimes. Um, and so just really narrowing that focus to that is all it is. It's you and the other person. And can you see them on their terms? Yeah. I mean, that, that's huge. And it sounds, it sounds very simple and simplistic in a sense. And when I got to graduate school, I, I, like I said, I didn't get it. I, I kind of knew that that was a component and important, but for me, I thought that I needed, and what was most important was to get all this information in because that would enable me to fix things. And it, and and I realized how crazy it is. And as a, as I'm, you know, admitting this again for the umpteenth time, um, it it was. You know, I think a lot of people get into this field because they want to help. And and oftentimes that translates into fixing. Uh, but what you're talking about here really is profound, just that 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 beingness, you know, and being able to do that and to to attune to some that's that's incredible stuff. Yeah, I mean, if we can imagine what it's like when people are attuning to us, you know, I always think about like when somebody asks you about something you're really excited about and they right. genuinely want to hear about it. What's right. that? I mean, that's a great feeling. Yeah. It's a crazy <laughs> feeling. You're like, Oh my God, someone's actually <laughs> caring and listening to me. Yeah. It's, it's so true. And it, it, you know, it, it also brings up the idea of authenticity and, and with, with both parties involved, you know, it's, it's crazy. Well, let me just um, uh, reintroduce you here. I'm speaking with Carrie Heckman. And let's talk about a, um, a go-to book recommendation. What do you have? Right. So I, I did bring um, Dr. Sharon Stanley's oh. book with me today to talk about. It's called 
uh, relational and body-centered practices for healing trauma, lifting the burdens of the past. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it, I mean, it's reasonable. It's a reasonable length. <laughs> Um, and I think something that I've struggled with, and I, I've, uh, and this is a book for clinicians, um, but something that I've struggled with in the trauma literature um, for both myself and for clients is I think that um, a lot of it is re-traumatizing. A lot of it is detailed descriptions about mm. trauma and how those things are, um, you know, healed, which is so important for, for us as clinicians to read and understand um, but it's sometimes hard of knowing where to direct clients because they, they want information on nervous system healing, but don't always know where to go for that to where there won't be lengthy mm -hmm. descriptions of, of different traumas, but for clinicians, and I, I, I think this is that book, right? You know, there's, there's information about that, but mostly this is a practice book about, um, how to attune, how to resonate, how to use your um, innate uh, skill to um, be with and uh, um, and and it's it's less technique, right? It's not about here are some some things that um, we we can do to elicit body sensation or we can do to it's really just about um, trusting yourself and, you know, if you, if you know these things and then you can uh, have your own embodiment, you know, then you can really make a difference in a person's life. And I think that that it's, it's incredibly inspirational and I would recommend it to anyone. Yeah. Well said. I read that book and it is awesome. Um, it's one, one I recommend uh, all the time to people. We'll have that listed here at the show notes page at the trauma therapist podcast.com. Carrie, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? I would love for people to get in touch with me. Um, probably the easiest way is to go to my website, which is carriejheckman.com. Um, and I'm sure you can put it in the show notes of how to spell my name. Um, but there you can kind of find links to, to, to link up with me on social media or send me a message. I'm probably the most active on Twitter. Um, fits my attention span. Okay. Um, Awesome. Yeah. Love connecting with other clinicians. Um, awesome. Awesome. What well, was awesome meeting you and having you on here um, again, what you do and what you're talking about here is, is what I hope that this podcast is about because I think it's so inspiring. So thanks so much for taking the time to, to, to join me today. Of course. Anytime. All right. Take care. You too.